17. It is page, I think, 852 in our church Bibles. 852 in our church Bibles. I think it was 852 this morning. I believe it's still. Yes, sir. Alright. Luke chapter number 17. We're going to start at verse number 11. When you got to say, I got it. Any more time, say, oh. Alright, verse number 11. The word of the Lord simply says this. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, somebody say, one of them. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he prostrated himself. At Jesus' feet, I mean, he just laid out, got on down on the floor, amen, dirt, ground, and everything, and he thanked Jesus, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked him, were not ten made clean, but the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then Jesus said to him, get up. And go on your way. Your faith has made you well. The word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So uh, as we prepare ourselves for this season of the holidays, Thanksgiving, I want to uh, challenge us to have an attitude of gratitude as we go throughout this season. The title of today's sermon simply will be, uh, uh, Can You Be That One? Can you be that one? Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts and we will not sin against you and please send your anointing. That makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me, touch my body, and all that, uh, my mind, all these things, Lord, that will help me to deliver your word to your people. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, be the one. Tell them that, be the one. I can remember walking uh, through Great America. They told this story before, one summer day, some time ago, and a little boy who really wanted a candy apple. And he told his mother that, uh, you know, he wanted a candy apple. His mom told him, no, it's gonna mess up his stomach, you know, get on these rides. And, you know, this is before I had two of my own, so, you know, you, you ought to be very judgmental about the whole situation when you ain't got none. Uh, but this little boy fell on the floor and threw a temper tantrum for the ages. He was rolling around on the floor. I hate you! I hate you! I want a candy apple! I hate you! And I was screaming. And, and, you know, we are walking through Great America watching this, and Few of us that didn't know each other, you know, our eyes met though. And we all was like, mm, mm, mm. And, you know, looking at this young, 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 young kid, and you know, some of us had that unspoken dialogue. You know, like we know what would help that little boy. <laughs> you know, it's, it was me. You know, my dad would, uh, you know. Uh, I'd have gotten what my dad called something to cry about, praise God. <laughs> but, you know, I think underlying the reason why some of this felt so, you know, you know, interesting to some of us is and unsettling is we realized that this little boy certainly did not appreciate what he had access to. Here he is in the middle of an amusement park surrounded by all the rides and games and fun he could ever imagine. And it is at his disposal for free. But yet he is upset about the one thing his mom told him he could not have. This is so interesting that that one thing that remains out of our reach can really mess up 
our disposition in such a way that we can sort of just spit on all of the things that are within our reach, given to us as a blessing from God. I think this speaks to the nature of our contemporary society, where we are an ungrateful group of folk. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, not you, he ain't talking about you. <laughs> about the neighbor on the other side of the <laughs> Most perplexing part of this ungratefulness is often uh, reaching its peak during the holidays. Thanksgiving and Christmas, these holy days that have become shopping days. Commercialized. For all of us, you know, a good chunk of us this week, we gonna be anticipating Thursday where we'll just cook and eat ourselves into a coma. And then we'll wake up in time to go flood department stores for Black Friday. And we see it every year. These stores all across the country have been successful at creating an environment where people are standing outside for hours, sleeping outside on the ground, to try to get a hookup that ain't really a hookup. Because if you're paying attention, you realize that about three months ago, they started to inflate the prices in a lot of these places. So as they go down, you actually just play in regular price. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but yet, that one thing that we see on TV that we just know we need, we got two big screens, brothers, and we feel like we need one more for the bathroom. <laughs> you got to, you got your, 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 your pump sisters, but you just need that one more for, you know, just make everything complete. We'll just see on the news, we'll see it. It happens every year. Folks trampling each other, hitting each other, breaking bones, stealing, fighting, arguing, screaming to pay money for something that they may not really need. And in a climate like this, I find the challenge for all of us is the people have got to be very clear and simple. That we must not allow ourselves to be seduced by the spirit of holiday consumerism and compulsive behavior. That becomes the greedy breeding ground for selfishness, jealousy, and ungratefulness. Amen. I'm not telling you you shouldn't go shopping and buying gifts for your family, your friends, your loved ones, your pastors, praise God. <laughs> He ain't got bias, no gifts. We just keep living safe. Amen. That's all the gifts we need, praise God. At least me, y'all. I'm past done. Patrice, you have a question? I'm not telling you not to, you know, show your love by giving and receiving gifts. What I am telling all of us is that even if you don't get one more material thing, how many of you know we ain't got something to be thankful for? You may not have the car you want, but you got a reason to say thank you. You may not have the house you dreamed about, but you got a reason to say thank you. Your boo may not be all that you thought he or she should be. You may not be as healthy as you want. You may not have the job you imagine. Your home life may be a little upside down. Your job may be, you know, stressing you out. Your school experience may be having you think twice. But even with all these things, how many of you know we still got a reason to give thanks? Pat us up on the chest and holler, I got a reason to give thanks. So, so our text becomes helpful in reminding us about the need and necessity of having an attitude of gratitude. For in this particular account of the ten lepers in the book of Luke, many of us that have been here for a while, we remember that the book of Luke, the gospel according to Luke, one of the last gospels written, the last accounts of the story of Jesus. It was written by a physician whose name was Luke. Luke was not around during uh, the actual uh, 
activity of Jesus, but Luke got eyewitness accounts from the Apostle Peter, who hung out with Jesus, got eyewitness accounts from the Apostle Paul, who actually studied with the rest of the disciples. So Luke wrote a particular account of the gospel, the life of Jesus, and he was writing it not to a Jewish audience or a Roman audience per se, but Luke was writing it to a very diverse Greek audience, which means that Luke understood that if this message of the work of Christ was going to resonate across time and place and culture, that he had to nuance his story in such a way that everyone who read it would be able to see themselves in the work of God in the world. And I want to submit to you that it is no accident that we are here, a diverse group of folk seeking after God, experiencing the ways and the work of God, because it is a point of fact that unless people see themselves in the work of God in the world, God's work can often remain anonymous to them. So could it be that you, with all your swag and all your flyness, or you with no swag, <laughs> no flyness. You that are black and white and rich and poor, Latino and Asian, you that are from Hunters Point and the other folk that are from the Berkeley Hills and from the Deep East and from Claremont, that all of our diversity is necessary because people around us need to see God working in someone like them. You know, living in Bay Area, and folks make you think you silly for believing in God. You so silly. Come on into the new age, the progressive age, where we are too smart for God. Ain't some you showing up believing in some foolishness? Yeah, but you won't believe that there's something greater than you out here holding this stuff together. Yes. I don't know about you, but I, 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 there better be something greater than this Republican Party, this Democratic Party, and this presidential stuff, and these dictators and all this stuff around the world. How many know that God sits high and he looks low, and God is still taking good care of all of us? Give your neighbor a high five and tell them God's taking good care of you and me. So this multicultural awareness that is the stream throughout Luke's gospel is so embedded in this story because you see that these lepers that Jesus encounters on the way to the village he is visiting is located between the regions of Samaria and Galilee. And these two cities are cities that are a little bit racially segregated. All right, Samaritans uh, were mixed race Jews and uh, non-Jewish folk left over from the Babylonian and Persian captivity. And many of these folks were resented by the purebred Jews. Because they felt like, why are you marrying them folk over there? Don't you know that, you know, we got to stick together? We never marry nobody who ain't my race. This is how the Jews were thinking. So the Samaritans kind of all hung out together. And then you had the Galilean Jews, and they all hung out together. And their cities were together, you know, you know, in the same proximity. Uh, but then you had these lepers. And in these lepers, ten lepers, you had a very diverse group of lepers. And ain't it interesting that when you got a whole lot, you were willing to separate yourself from other folk. Yeah. How many know you can get sick or down low enough where differences don't matter? Right. You start to remember, man, we human beings. And we just struggling. So I said, struggling, amen. Man, you black, you struggling just like me. You white struggling just like me. You a woman, you a man, you, you American, Iraq, whatever, you struggling just like me. That there comes a moment in our lives where we have to get past the labels and the categories and remember that God has created all of us in his image. Yes. And this is what I think is happening here. You have a wonderful uh, a description of the diversity in this group of folk, and they all were in need of something unique that Jesus had to offer. At the heart of this message today, I want you to appreciate that Jesus comes in and reminds 
us that the gospel can meet every one of our needs, answer every one of our questions, save every one of our souls, heal every one of our diseases, and these lepers represent the totality of our human experience because they were ostracized. How many know there are going to be some moments in our lives where we will be on the outs? Folks are going to kind of push us to the margins and think badly of us. If you were a leper, you were an outcast in the worst way. You were ostracized and regulated to living your life in seclusion, away from the comforts of community and family. This is why the disease of leprosy was not just one of physical pain, but one of literally internal and exterior numbness and isolation. For a person who had leprosy, and during that time, leprosy, uh, commonly today is called as Hansen's disease, uh, leprosy made folks unable to feel anything per se, except in the early stages of their diseases. But as the disease worsened, it progressively deadened the nerve cells, making the patients unable to feel. So they were no longer alert or aware of the external things that were threats or dangers to their body. So for instance, a leper would not be aware that when they're trying to turn a doorknob that it is locked. You know, we turn the doorknob and it's locked, the resistance of the door will make us stop. How many of you ever try to open something that was just, just sealed tight? You know, you're like, mm, you know, and you pour water on it, that don't work, I don't know how to do that. Or you like, hit the bottom of it, you know, you're doing all these little tricks. But a leper would not appreciate the torque or the resistance or the pressure they're putting on their limbs and their skin. So the more force they would use, they would develop sores and sometimes even rip the skin off of their their body, they may have a dust particle or a rock, you know, walking down the street in these in these very kind of uh, dusty environments. We get in their eye, and, you know, we would scratch our eye till it came out, but a leper may scratch their eye and not realize that the, the particle is tearing into their eyeball. You know, they were just unaware of the impact that these things were having on their body, so much so that open sores that were not dealt with would get infected, and they would break out look uh, with no limbs, they might have no limbs, and have all these uh, deformities in their body, and people would think that they were contagious, and that's why they would force them to move out into other parts of the region. And I want you to appreciate that it was not the reality that these lepers were contagious. It was a perception, an assumption. But the people's assumption and perception still force these folks to be displaced. And I hope you and I can be a people who are always aware of our assumptions and our perceptions about one another and how sometimes they are not grounded in reality. How many of you know we all got some bad stereotypes and assumptions about other folk? I wish I had an honest church in here today. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And we can treat folk based off of our assumptions and not based off of their reality. And we have to be so careful as people of God to interrogate our own assumptions about one another. And not be so quick to buy into the hype or the misinformation that is fed about us. I was in uh, Ohio a couple weeks ago uh, talking to some uh, suburban pastors, majority of whom uh, were uh, white pastors. Uh, we were talking about gun violence, mass incarceration. A lot of our evangelical pastors and friends are taking a hard look trying to understand how do we engage in this issue of gun violence and mass incarceration. And one of the pastors, you know, after you know we get past all the you know preliminaries and all that kind of stuff, he was really honest with me and he said, you know, Pastor Mike. A lot of people in my church, my community, just have one question. We try to figure out, how come your people in the neighborhoods and the cities just don't work? Don't get a job. Why they need handouts like Obamacare? He was honest. And I appreciate his honesty. Yeah, man, folks can't be honest, some of us, some of us ready to fight right now. We're like, what? 
<laughs> and see, we don't have our own conversation about them folks. Mm -hmm. But I said, I said to him, I said, you know, what's so fascinating about their statement is that, you know, most, because he said, you know, in my community, in my congregation, we have lots of people who are losing their homes. They're working two or three jobs just to try to make their ends meet. We have folk who are, you know, struggling to make it, and if, if our folks are struggling not getting help, why should people there get help? And I said, well, you know what's fascinating about your statement? Many of us who don't live in the suburbs feel like if you get to the suburbs, you ain't struggling. <laughs> Many feel like you done got heaven on earth, so just for you to say that you got folk working two or three jobs in the suburbs to make their ends meet is news to me. And I said, and I just love to enlighten you to say that most of the folks I know in the neighborhood is working two or three jobs. Try to make ends meet. So it's not the folk ain't working. It's just that our economy and our opportunities are so limited for your folk and my folk. But rather than us uniting around our common pain and struggle about the lack of resources in our country, we'll let the assumptions we have of one another be manipulated by forces invisible to us and make us think that we are each other's enemy. You know, this pastor had tears in his eyes. He started to cry. And we had a great conversation. We talked a little bit about how we can, you know, bridge some of this. Now, of course, I'm in California, here in Ohio, so, you know, it's a long distance, you know, bridge we got to build. But the point still remains is this is he had an assumption that was misinformed. I have some assumption that is misinformed. And when we live off of our assumptions, how many of we will push people to the edges of our circle of influence and belonging. And I realize that if you are a human being created by God, we are all each other's responsibility to take good care of together. Yeah. Somebody say amen. Duke. And, you know, that's what people told me. 
North Carolina, you a Duke man. I said, a Duke man? What is that about? And that degree gonna open up some doors for you. I said, well, I feel like Jesus was opening up some doors before I got to you. Matter of fact, how do you think I got in the You know, quiet as it's kept, I was not a very good student. I got kicked out of UC Davis my second year in school. Up there playing video games. <laughs> Ain't that just the most dick scene you ever heard of? I can play video games. <laughs> how, many, how many UC Davis out there on the, you know, we have the quad, you know, everybody playing spades, dominoes, and I'm ready to go to class, I'm out there playing spades, dominoes, and, 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 and video games. And they kicked me out of school. They sure never did. They sent me right the corner. <laughs> And I ended up going to a Bible college and, you know, I did okay there, but, you know, I had a 4.0. You know, my highest GPA in my life was at Duke University. I'll tell you never, that had to be God. <laughs> and then, what's the point? It's not that I'm smart. You know, I study for them grades. I mean, I pulled all night, we down, all of us pray together. You know, we prayed, we fasted, we studied, and all kinds of things. <laughs> But anybody ever looked around and just said, how did I end up here? Right. It's not because of your own goodness, but it is because of the mercy and the favor of God. And when you don't know that, then you thank everybody else but God. Right. Tell you that you better recognize that you not delivered from drugs because you had a strong will. <laughs> Just 
recognize it. The scripture says he turned around and came back to the one that healed him. And I want to say to you, child of God, that you better be that one person that keeps coming back into the presence of the one that heals you. Don't you ever get so comfortable and so busy and in a hurry and so important that you forget to come back All right. and fall simply doing what was expected of them in the context of their culture. For after a leper got healed, they were supposed to go show themselves to the priest so the priest could give them a clean bill of health and welcome them back into the community. And you understand, the priest thought that it was just as hard to raise a person from the dead than it was to heal a leper. So the priest had to see that thing for themselves. So these folk obviously ostracized from their family. The first thing, I don't blame them. I'm going to the priest because I want to get home. They were supposed to go show themselves to the priest. After all those years of being sick and isolated, it was a, it was a human response, reasonable, to now be able to be free to go back home. But isn't it interesting that in their haste to go back home, they created distance from the one who healed them. And I want to say to all of us in here today that after we get what God decides to bless us with, don't go further away from God. Don't be in such a rush. Ooh, I got to hook up. See you later, God. And you in this season, don't allow the commercials and the sales and the culture, these crazy shows, the media, move you away from the one who made your healing possible in the first place. You want to keep saying thank you? You got to stay in the presence of the one who healed you. The key is to keep coming back to God through prayer. The key is to come back to God through worship. The key is to come back and you're serving. The key is to keep coming back yeah. to God. Yeah. Let me tell you something cool about coming back to God. When you come back to God, you usually come back to the place where God healed you. Yeah. All right. Some of us get so important, we get so, you know, uh, what's the word we, we talk about? Uh, upward mobility. You know, we all look for upward mobility. Boy, we just want to go up.
Thanksgiving dinner and get on your chair or table and start hollering like I just did. <laughs> Nor am I telling you to sit there in a the corner and leave anonymous the source of all what God has done for you. Yes. When the time comes for you to be able to declare what you're thankful for, make it known that I'm thankful to God. Listen, we've got some of that credit. And you never know, some of your family members, you know the ones you hide from all year long?